Welcome to the session, Falsifiability and the Irreducibility Crisis. I am Elliot Bloom, the moderator of this session. Today we have two distinguished speakers in our session, Professor Deborah Mayo and Professor Anastios Atsonis. Professor Mayo is a professor emerita in the Department of Philosophy at Virginia Tech and holds a visiting appointment at the Center for the Philosophy of Natural and Social Sciences of the London School of Economics. Professor Tonis is a distinguished professor emeritus, Department of Mathematical Sciences, Atmospheric Science Group, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and Adjunct Research Scientist, Hydraulic Research Center, San Diego, California. As a way of introduction to this session, I will briefly discuss falsifiability in the empirical science versus mathematics, logic, and metaphysical systems. Starting in the early 1930s, the American philosopher Karl Popper worked the problem of finding a criteria which would enable distinguishing between the empirical sciences on the one hand and mathematics, logic, as well as metaphysical systems on the other, which he called the problem of demarcation. He proposed falsifiability as his formal demarcation. Paraphrasing Popper, a theory is invented by a psychological process that is beyond the logical analysis of scientific knowledge. One seeks the validity of this theory by comparing the theory's predictions with the results of practical applications and experiments. So long as the theory withstands detailed and severe tests and is not superseded by another theory in the course of scientific progress, we may say that it has proved its mettle or that it is corroborated by the past experience. But as soon as the decision is negative, or in other words, even if even one significant conclusion of the theory is falsified, then its falsify falsification also falsifies the theory from which it was logically deduced. An interesting example of the applica application of falsifiability is to psychiatry. It is a mixed result as discussed by Professor of Psychiatry John O. Beers, who is in the audience today, in a 2006 paper published in Clinical Neuropsychiatry. Again, paraphrasing Dr. Beers, psychiatry is both biomedical science and a socio-political process. Thus, psychiatry bridges two fundamentally different types of domains. It is a biomedical science, and at this level is subject to testing and falsifiability or falsification by scientific assessment tools such as controls experimentation. At the same time, it is a sociopolitical, and at this level can be assessed only through value-dependent utility criteria such as the ways that we citizens try to assess the effects of political policies, i.e. results matter. I submit that psychiatry is a discipline not alone with these dual and somewhat conflicting characteristics. The first talk today will be given by Professor Deborah Mayo and is entitled P-Value Reforms, Fixing Science or Threats to Replication and Falsification. I'm very happy to be here, and I thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's a topic I'm very interested in. There's no doubt that with mounting failures of replication, people are getting very serious about reforms, and there's a real urgency in critically evaluating some of these attempts. And that's what I will talk about. Um, this picture is from my blog where it uh, is called Why Some of the Reforms Are Doing More Harm Than Good, <laughs> that you would think. Many of the reforms are welcome, such as pre-registration and testing for replication we're hearing about. 
Others are quite radical and paradoxically even obstruct some of the methods that we know will improve upon replication. In fact, the statistics wars, which have been raging for um, about 100 years, have come in a, a new guise today. And in this new guise, I think they're largely proxy battles between competing thought leaders who are keen to promote their own particular method or philosophy. And I'm very concerned with certain bandwagons that are out there, political groupthink, a great term that I saw on the website of this conference. Um, and of course here, the politics is the politics of statistics. So how to combat this really requires a complicated mix of statistical, philosophical, historical, and political research, resources. And more than anything else, a large dose of chutzpah, the, <laughs> the, as I say in my book, the Yiddish word for guts, because you have to be able to confront and disagree with some leaders in statistics, in the history of statistics, philosophy, and so on. Uh, is everybody hearing me like this? Okay. Um, the most often used methods are the ones most often criticized, statistical significance tests. But I discovered this paradox. On the one hand, a critic of tests says, it's just much too easy to get these small p-values. But wait a minute. The crisis of replication is all about it's much too difficult to get small p-values when we try to replicate effects that others got with new subjects but with more stringent controls and pre-registration. So it, is it easy or is it hard? Well, it's easy if you lie with statistics, as um, R.A. Fisher, the founder of Statistical Significance Test, said, and he called it the political principle, sufficient finagling, cherry-picking, p-hacking, trying and trying again, and so on, can practically guarantee a preferred claim will get support even if it's unwarranted. And this is just a fundamental idea of bad evidence. If your method had little, if any, capability of uncovering flaws in your claim, then not finding flaws isn't evidence for that claim. As mentioned, this is a Popperian idea. Mere supporting instances are too cheap to be worth having. They only count if they've passed at least minimally stringent tests, tests that would have found flaws if they're there, at least with high probability. And the sources of irreplication aren't really mysterious. A lot of fields have latitude between the raw data and claims, and there's a lot of opportunity for these biasing selection effects. Not only that, there are some crass abuses of tests, and this is John Ioannidis' famous paper, saying, you know what's causing the high rate of non-replication? It's people going from a single small p-value to claiming conclusive research finding. Do people really do that? He says they do. Shame on them if they do. Uh, again, R.A. Fisher taught us long ago that we're not interested in an isolated small p-value, but a reliable method of procedure. You don't have evidence that you've demonstrated a genuine experimental effect until you know how to bring about results that will rarely fail to give us statistically significant results. And if you can do that, then of course you have falsified a claim that there is no genuine effect. And Popper uh, appealed to R.A. Fisher in talking about statistical falsification, which is what we normally have in science. So everybody knows Fisher's simple significance test. 
in testing the conformity of data with some claim, often called a null or a test hypothesis, we have a function that measures the distance or the difference between the data and what the hypothesis predicts. And the larger its value, the more inconsistent the data are, thanks, um, with the hypothesis. Okay. And the p-value corresponds to this random variable. It's the probability of getting an even larger difference than you did under the assumption of the null hypothesis. And this, by the way, is uh, <laughs> part of a paper that I authored with um, Sir David Cox, where we were trying to find a middle ground between Neyman Pearson and Fisherian test. So the reasoning here, it's straightforward. If even larger differences than you got can readily be brought about by chance or background variability alone, then you obviously don't have grounds for ruling out that being the source of your effect. A small p-value, at least in principle, indicates some underlying discrepancy from H0 because very probably you would have gotten a smaller difference than you did in a world where H0 is approximately correct. And of course, if you repeatedly do so, it is stronger. But even so, the small p-value isn't evidence of a genuine effect. We just said we would need to be able to reliably bring it about. Much less is it evidence of a scientific conclusion. I'll write that as um, H star, some substantive claim that involves theoretical causal quantities and so on. And this is just classic, everybody uh, knows, <laughs> statistical is not substantive, correlation is not cause, because the H star substantive claim is making assertions that haven't been probed by the statistical test. Insofar as it, as it hasn't, you don't have corroboration, you don't have a severe test of H star. Now, Naaman Pearson came along and improved upon Fisherian tests back in the 1930s and um, tried to obstruct just this problem of going from statistical to substantive. With their test, we have not just, they call it a test rather than a null hypothesis, and that's a better term. It's just null is such a, a nice short word, so I use it too. But you have a test, but also he introduced the alternative hypothesis, and the two must exhaust the parameter space. So it could be that some mean is less than zero versus greater than zero. At least this fallacy of going from a statistical result to an H star conclusive research finding is blocked because research of rejecting the null will only indicate a statistical alternative or how discrepant from the null your evidence is. And with this alternative, we get the type two error, not just erroneously rejecting, but erroneously failing to reject. And uh, we get the comp corresponding notion of power. So it becomes very strange that criticisms of statistical significance tests nearly always stick to the simple Fisherian test, and they do have their uses, especially in testing assumptions, uh, but it completely overlooks the ability to infer effect sizes and use power, and um, all of that was deliberately designed by Neyman, who was also developing confidence intervals at the exact same time. So for example, in the case of non-significant results, this um, paraphrasing here, Neyman, he said, if the power to detect a meaningful effect is high, then repeatedly failing to find one warrants taking it as absent. Again, we might first have a mere indication of absence and then uh, actually evidence of it. My own preferred way is to use the observed p-value and use the non-significant result to set an upper bound that at least we actually have good evidence that the discrepancy is, that, <laughs> is not that high. In other cases, the most you could do is say, 
he said, no evidence against. But we all know it would be a fallacy to take that as evidence for the null hypothesis. Again, this is why he developed um, power and confidence intervals. And despite philosophical disagreements, which you might read about between Naaman, Pearson, and Fisher, actually both of their kinds of methods fall under tools for appraising and controlling the probability of seriously misleading interpretations of data. That's Alan Birnbaum. That is, controlling error probabilities. And I place all such methods under the rubric of error statistics, which is a, 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 a more useful term uh, than frequentist. It includes confidence intervals and resampling randomization and um, all of these kinds of tests. So what Naaman and Pearson both realized, although Naaman and Pearson were more aggressive about blocking the problems, but they both realized that uh, this error control is completely lost by selective reporting, the political principle, right? Data finagling. So for example, if you have 20 sets of differences and just one seems large enough to test, and let's say it turns out to be significant at the 5% level, nominally, the actual level of significance is not 5%, but more like 64%, depending, of course, on uh, dependencies. And this is from Morrison and Hankel's significance test controversy book way back. It just seems like people had to rediscover them in the last you know, 20 years or something. Uh, so for example, we have fraud busters, Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson rediscovering that data-dependent hypotheses are a major source of suspicious and um, spurious significance level and stopping rules also. And so they propose this 21-word solution what you have to do is explicitly report your sampling plan. These 21 words would go into the methods section, and um, that should help protect. OK. That's a welcome reform. Um, other people will blame the test. OK. And my view is statistical significance tests don't kill inferences, but people do. <laughs> 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 and um, what's even worse are those methods where the abuse vanishes. The abuse from selective reporting vanishes. What do I mean? On some views, taking account of these biasing selection effects defies common sense. This is Stephen Goodman, who's uh, not far from here, and he's one of the co-directors of the Meta Research Institute at Stanford. And he says the problem with these frequentist accounts is that the way they deal with multiple comparisons and data dredging is by adjusting the p-value so that the nominal level is closer to the actual one. And he says uh, you're, you're adjusting for something that has nothing to do with the evidence. Here's where we get into the philosophical differences which are rarely discussed about distinct notions of evidence. And this um, corresponds really to the difference between falsification and confirmation, or now philosophers are more likely um, to use probabilisms instead of confirmation theory. The bottom line is that the probabilisms will condition on the actual data whereas the error probabilities always require considering outcomes that could have occurred but different. There's no other way to get at the capability of a method except by looking at this sampling distribution. What's the probability we would have gotten such an impressive result even if it's false? So we're always looking at how it would react to other data. So there's this very important underlying difference about evidence. And um, this corresponds to a technical uh, point or principle that's called the likelihood principle that will just look 
at the likelihood. And um, if you recognize that there are these different philosophies, you can start to understand why reformers so often talk completely past each other. <laughs> The original classic view from subjective Bayesian Dennis Lindley is all of these significance levels of power, they all depend on something more than the likelihood function, and all that is irrelevant because the Bayesian will condition on the actual outcomes. This is still there buried underneath today's conflicts, even though it rarely comes to the surface. And it's rather ironic that many of the reforms that were offered follow this principle from which it follows that the data dredging doesn't matter to the evidence. For example, a popular count, look at likelihood ratios or Bayes factors, they can be used in the complete absence of a sampling plan, they assure us. Um, you putting up five minutes, so I have 20 minutes, right, total. I think it's 22, it's going to be. Um, <laughs> data should be able to speak for itself, say, uh, Berger and Walpart in their likelihood principle. Um, my feeling is if someone's trying to sell you an account where the sampling plan doesn't matter, you might want to hold off by, because if you care about uh, replication, you care about error and probabilities. Um, it's true that probabilists can still claim, well, we will block all of those counterintuitive inferences by putting in our prior beliefs. And that could work in some cases, but you're getting here an additional source of variability, and don't forget, prior probabilities can also be data dependent. The other thing is, is it doesn't really show what the researcher has done wrong if you have to invoke your beliefs in the claim. There's a big difference between the believability of a claim and how well tested it is. You might want to say, I in fact know it's true, but it's very poorly tested. Um, and many data dredge claims are believable. That's what makes them so uh, seductive. And some Bayesians, very few, um, reject probabilism in some form. Somebody like Andrew Gelman calls himself a falsificationist Bayesian, and here he is writing with an error statistician, um, Shalizi, and they say what we advocate is what Cox and Hinckley call the pure, the simple significance test, and um, this is what we're going to use to test assumptions, which I call auditing. And that's great, but then you can't also champion the view that says abandon statistical significance, because you need them for your own test. So this gets to my uh, last uh, item, that last March, some people were putting forward this view that we should ban certain words, <laughs> Uh, and not just ban words like significance or significant, but also ban the use of pre-designated thresholds. And the editors of a special issue of the American Statistician were promoting this in an editorial that was just an introduction to other papers. Okay. Um, but it isn't just a word ban. The most important thing is a gatekeeper ban, that you don't have those thresholds. Here's what John Ioannidi said. Retiring statistical significance would give bias a free pass. Potential for falsification is a prerequisite for science. Fields that obstinately resist reputation can hide behind the abolition of statistical significance, but they risk becoming self-ostracized from the remit of science. And I agree and uh, wrote a, a paper on this. If you think about how uh, radical this would be to comply with this no threshold view, it would completely preclude the FDA's uh, long established drug review procedures. So why do they do it? Why they don't, the main argument they give is that 
They think if you remove the p-value thresholds, researchers will lose their incentive to p-hack and to cheat and to try and try again. Even if that were true, it would be a very bad argument. It would be like arguing decriminalizing robbery you know, is a good idea because it results in less robbery arrests. You know, uh, but they're still stealing. But as a matter of fact, it's not true. It's because even without the word significance, the eager researcher can still can't take a large or non-significant p-value to indicate a genuine effect. We saw this in the reasoning about tests. It would be to say that even though even larger differences than what I got are readily brought about by chance alone, I claim my data are good evidence that it was not due to chance alone. And that would just be illogical. So the eager researcher would still need to report a reasonably small p-value. They would follow the usual methods of putting spin on their data, of data dredging, ransacking the data to find some subgroup where the drug seemed to show benefit, and so on. The problem is it would be a lot harder uh, to hold them accountable for violating the threshold because we are told in this little editorial by Wasserstein, uh, Sherm, and Lazar that whether p-values pass a predesignated threshold shouldn't matter at all. Okay, so there's a big problem there, and even though journal editors are being asked to follow this, uh, many are saying no, <laughs> just say no. Um, so this is New England Journal of Medicine, who say that p-values interpreted by reliably calculated thresholds subjected to appropriate adjustments for multiple trials have an important role in the decisions that clinicians and regulatory agencies um, have to make, and um, we're not going to give up on them. The important thing is this no threshold view precludes any kind of test, even tests that some people like to use based on either confidence intervals or base factors, and no tests, no falsification. If you can say about any of the results ahead of time that they are not allowed to be counted as evidence for my claim, then you don't have a test of that claim. And that's what happens. I don't say that they deliberately, my, my whole point is that people don't see the consequences of some of these um, recommendations. You shouldn't refuse having a threshold for at least distinguishing terrible from fairly good evidence with using a fixed p-value across all studies, like 0.05 forever and ever. And um, Naaman and Pearson certainly didn't uh, recommend this. They said that you should balance and you should attach the hypothesis with a certain um, error probability, making use of sensible empirical and theoretical um, thresholds. So, my own view, which uh, I won't have time to discuss, is exactly to reformulate tests so that they do take account of actual outcomes and the form of inference is in terms of discrepancies that are and are not warranted. This not only avoids the classic misinterpretations and abuses of significance tests, it also improves on competence intervals, and I fleshed out this view in the same paper with David Cox using a more um, Fisherian guide. So we will be able to avoid magnitude effects by saying we may have evidence for some discrepancy, but not one that big. And we will avoid uninformative negative results by setting the upper bound along the lines that I mentioned earlier with naming. There is now a new American Statistical Association task force on statistical significance tests and replication. Yes, they use that word deliberately in the name of the task force. And um, the ex-president, uh, Karen Kefada, 
uh, says that what this group needs to do is prepare a piece reflecting good statistical practice without leaving the impression that p-values and hypothesis tests have no um, role in that good practice. So to conclude, um, the sources of irreplication are not mysterious. There are gaps between raw data and claims we're interested in. We should look much more at the, these gaps and the things that we're measuring aren't really um, telling us about some of the theoretical conclusions we want. And it can make it too easy to dredge up impressive looking findings, even though they're spurious. And many of the reforms, I think, are, are helpful, move away from cookbook statistics that have been lampooned for 80 years. Um, but some of the others intended to fix science actually enable rather than reveal illicit inferences due to p-hacking, data dredging, etc., either because they obey the likelihood principle or try to, try very hard to obey it, or they block the most recent uh, reform, block p-value thresholds. I discuss this much more in my book. Statistical inference as severe testing, how to get beyond the statistics wars. Okay, and thank you. Did I make? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to say that if my ears are still very blocked from the plane, so you might have to shout. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if you uh, might have some insight. Um, you know, I've observed that in engineering, the physical sciences, statistical methods almost entirely involve confidence intervals, never hypothesis testing. Social studies, it's the other way around. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, uh, most of them uh, will move from testing to confidence intervals. But of course, confidence intervals are completely dual to tests. Neyman developed them as inversions of tests. The values of the parameter that are in the confidence interval are those that you could not reject at the corresponding significance level. You could get your lower uh, um, confidence interval bound by simply reporting on the value of the parameter that the observed data are statistically significantly greater than at the corresponding level. You can get your upper bound by reporting on the parameter value such that your data are statistically significantly lower than. So I do not have time to give this uh, discussion of confidence intervals. So it becomes very silly uh, to say that we are going to use confidence intervals, although my reformulation of tests really combines confidence intervals with um, tests, okay, uh, because it's exactly the same reasoning. saying that um, it, it's good to shoot a, a chicken in order to make the monkeys behave. Um, what, what is it, it saying? It's, it's good to shoot a chicken to make the monkeys behave. I think I heard that after they no, uh, executed the uh, head of the Chinese FDA. Um, <laughs> and that's true. Um, I was wondering how you would police the reforms uh, of, of statistical significance testing. So how to bring out these consequences? Um, it, you might be surprised to find that when we're given various alternatives, their consequences and the ramifications are never discussed. Moreover, alternative accounts, which some of them we've been using for a long time and we know where their fallibilities are, no word is allowed of criticism of, let's say, base factors. And we know how easy it is to get the result to be in favor of either the null or the alternative, depending on how you choose your prior, spike prior, choose your alternative. These things, that's step number one. Um, and I advocated this to Ron Wasserstein for the American Statistical Association, and he didn't disagree. But you will notice that um, other methods aren't critiqued. I guess 
that's not policing, but that's a beginning of a professional discussion that is balanced. <laughs>